hate when the Holy Spirit encounters you before you preach. It's like it messes up your ability to cognitively make you Lord. Well, I'm going to attempt to preach on the glory and the presence of God tonight. I believe that we're in days where there's such a crisis in the earth that it's creating a desperate need in the house of God for us to offer the world something it can't find. And so any attempt that we can facilitate to allow the Holy Spirit to move and have His way where we can offer people truth is going to be very important in the days that we're living into. That whole drive-through entertainment model of church is becoming extinct in America. There is great shaking that is coming to this nation. We've prophesied it. We've said it. COVID is a precursor for greater shaking that's coming. So you're literally going to see the best of days and the worst of days on the horizon. And there is going to be incredible glory and revival and presence for a remnant of people who learn how to move with God. Amen. All right, three of you. Did I lose you? And so I'm going to read even tonight from the Azusa Street Revival. If I could sum up what's happening to me right now, here's my dilemma or here's my problem. I have the prophet in me who's kind of the normal me. And then I have um, the altar school coming up where I'm going to be teaching a 14-week course on revival history. So I am more studied and devouring late into the night hours. I have a, a deep burden from the Lord for this generation. Um, we cannot cry out for revival and be ignorant of how God has moved in the past. So um, starting in August, when the school's back in session, we're going to go after 14 weeks of revival history. And then I'm bringing in who I believe are the most authentic revivalists in the world to the school. So you're going to get a dose of revival history from a historical perspective. And then you're going to get revival now right in front of your face. So I've been consumed with, with the, the research and the spirit of revival in me tied into the prophet. And then I'm in major apostolic builder mode with the launch of the Ark Fellowship. So I'm intensely going back and studying the scriptures concerning what is the difference between an American church and a New Testament church. So I have this ball of tension in me. And so I'm going to do my best, but I'm just sort of warning you. I think it's good to kind of try to get an idea because sometimes people are preaching. You're like, where is this brother coming from? And so you're going to kind of hear that tension. You're going to hear the prophet. I'm going to prophesy to some of you and just invite you into a fresh encounter with the Lord. You're going to hear about revival and Azusa Street and some of that and then we're going to talk a little bit about the house of God out of Genesis 28 so pray for your brother will you I need help I needed help before the message but now after the encounter I need mega help Holy Spirit all right if you have in your Bibles would you turn to Genesis chapter 28 I want to look at a dream that Jacob had. It's the very first reference of the house of God in Scripture. 
kind of build a, a foundation there. Thank you, Lord. You know, the presence of God and his glory was always something that the people of Israel longed for and desired. If you look at them building the tabernacle, or plural, all throughout the Old Testament, the difference between them and us is we gather around a communicator or a brand they gather around the ark, the presence of God. So community formed around the presence of God. For us, community forms around a famous preacher and whatever our favorite church is. So that <clears throat> has always deeply impacted my heart. And so I think that we're going to begin to get a revelation of that so let's look at Genesis 28 10 then Jacob departed from Beersheba and went toward Haran and he came to a certain place and spent the night there because the sun had set and he took one of the stones of the place and put it under his head and laid down in that place now everybody thank God for your pillow tonight it's not a stone. Praise God. And he had a dream. And behold, a ladder was set on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord your God. Of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. And the land on which you are living. I will give it to you. And your descendants. Your descendants shall also be like the dust of the earth. And you shall spread out to the west, to the east, to the north, to the south. And you and your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, I am with you, and I will keep you wherever you go, and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely God is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Again, I want you to underline that. This is the house of God. It is the first reference in scripture. This is the house of God. So Jacob arose in the morning. He took the stone that he had put under his head. And he set it up as a pillar and poured oil on its top. And he called the name of that place Bethel. However, previously the name of the city had been Luz. Then Jacob made a vow and saying, If God will be with me and he will keep me on this journey that I take and will give me food to eat and garments to wear, I will return to my father's house in safety. Then the Lord will be my God. And this stone which I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. And all that he does give me, I will surely give a tenth to thee. That is what I call a loaded, pregnant passage of scripture that we're going to unpack. I've done a little slideshow, which those of you who know me, that's an incredible feat. But I've just done this so you could write them down. I want to just give you seven tonight, or just seven slides, one sentence apiece. I want to give you seven lessons from this passage of Scripture here in Genesis 28 concerning the house of God. Now, obviously, in order to be good New Covenant believers, we have to recognize that you and I are the temple of the Holy Spirit, 
who's being uh, built into an eternal dwelling place for God. So this message is not only applicable to you as the temple of the Holy Spirit, but I also believe we can stretch it a little bit concerning the house of God, meaning when we corporately gather together as believers. I hope that's clear. So I'm going after an individual and a corporate uh, application for this encounter that Jacob had in a dream. So let's look at this first lesson concerning the house of God, if we can uh, put that up there. Okay, so lesson one, without the presence of God, there is no house of God. All you have is a place. Jacob goes into a region, nothing really special about it. You can go into a church building if you've traveled. You can go into cathedrals and just beautiful buildings that have been erected toward God. But there's no house of God unless you have the presence of God. If you look at Exodus chapters 33 and 34, you find Moses having this conversation with God as he's been tasked to lead a million people on a journey across the desert into the promised land. And God says, I'll send my presence with you. And I love Moses' response to him, to the Lord. God, if you don't send your presence with me, what else will distinguish us from any other nation in the world? In other words, if you and I don't become carriers of the presence of God, wherever that we go, workplace, family environment, if we don't carry his presence and learn how to steward him, what else will distinguish? See, I get, I get a little nervous around people who make comments like, well, no one at my work knows I'm saved. If you've had a born-again experience, you have a completely different nature than those who are not born again. What you crave, what you desire, what you're supposed to be setting your mind on is completely contrary to the wisdom of the world. Anybody ever tried to, I mean, let's just start low. Have you ever tried to tell an unbeliever that you give 10% of your money to the church? To someone that doesn't, that's not, they think you're nuts, let alone you start talking to them about generous giving. Oh, I gave my tax return to the missionary, not a 70-inch TV. And again, I'm just talking about money because I know it just riles people up. But, but when you, we talk about what the born-again experience is really all about and what it leads us into, there should be some kind of distinguishing mark upon believers and unbelievers. We should be able to tell the difference between goats and sheep. Amen. All right, how are we doing? All right, again, we're, we're going to get delivered. What are we getting delivered from? The goal of fitting in. You gave up your right to fit in when you got born again. When you got born again, you were commissioned to stand out. I, I can't tell you how it touched me that Todd Smith did that one final act with these folks. 
Have you ever heard a preacher, rather than just tallying how many raised their hands, he says to this couple, if you weren't here, who was wanting to give their life to Christ, he said, now I'm going to try to talk you out of what you just said yes to. What's the thinking behind that? He's trying to help them to understand you cannot have one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom and claim to be born again. And, and I, want to, I want to encourage a generation not to be ashamed about what happened here tonight. This is actually normal. And people sitting in church acting like a robot is abnormal. All right, three of you. No, we, we, we need to be comfortable in growing in our love and our passion for Jesus. I hope it's still not awkward for you and your spouse to be passionately in love. No, it gets normal and it gets more passionate the longer you've been married. Well, it should be at least. Right, you, you, don't, you don't apologize for kissing your wife in public, do you? you? You don't apologize for going in a store and spending exuberant amounts of money for an anniversary or a date night, do you? You don't, oh, I'm so sorry. But yet sometimes our walk with Christ looks like that. We say to the world, I'm so sorry for being passionate about Jesus when the kingdom of God has never been about taking polls and asking people if they're comfortable with your relationship with Christ. Am I helping anybody? So there should be a perfume, the aroma of Christ. You should smell different, look different, act different we don't desire to stand out because we're prideful and arrogant but we just end up standing out because we can't help but be anything other than a new creation in Christ I can't help it it's just who I am amen so Jacob has this encounter. Moses is hungry for the presence of God. It's like, what would you ask for if you were tasked with leading a million people? Lord, I need some money. Lord, I need an army. I mean, what if you, some of you tonight, you're facing responsibility. You're facing needs. You're facing some, some invitation to lead. And God is saying, is at the top of your priority my presence? I think this is what I was running into tonight in the heart of God. That something is going to have to shift in this generation because of the crisis in the world. If they find out our priorities are the same as theirs. If people fearing COVID find out that the church is just as fearful of COVID. If our response as those filled with the Spirit of God is not different than those who are full of the Spirit of the world, we become ineffective in our mission to be gospel witnesses. All right, just take a deep breath for me. I've, some of you, it's just like we're uncomfortable with truth. Oh, the Bible says in 1 John, listen to God your Father, I have no greater joy than to hear of my children walking in truth. There's no greater joy that you can bring your father than for you to walk in truth that's going to not only set you free, but those around you. 
Hallelujah. We're just all on a journey, right, to get over the fear of man. Lord's going to knock on your door Monday at lunch. You're going to start sensing God wanting to do something in the restaurant, and the fight is on. What are they going to think? What are they going to do? What if they reject me? But I'm telling you, there's just that place of being around him and learning how to live in him where we stop apologizing about him. I mean, I just like even use an extreme example. I mean, I, I know we're all Holy Ghost rollers, so no one in here has ever been drunk. But I mean, have you ever heard of the drunk guy who was going 70 and hit a tree and walked away unharmed because he was so liquored up, he couldn't even feel pain? No, it might be too extreme for some people, but folks, when you get so full of the Holy Spirit and so secure in Him, you'll stop fearing the rejection of man. When, when, when you, the kingdom of God is our home, not our hotel. The, the presence of God, learning how to be a carrier, this is not like turn on the fount, like turn on the faucet one day a week and then and then get and then shut it off and do your deal and then come. No, this is a continual flow of the Holy Spirit. This is there are there are pleasures forevermore in His presence. This is again, it's it's trying to help us think rightly to repent means to change your mind. We need a mindset change about who we are in Him. I was created for intimacy. I was, God created me for eternal connection with Him. So when I see the things of the world going on around me, I have to remind myself I was not created to enjoy those pleasures. I was created to enjoy the pleasures of God. So I want you to track with me. Now we're redefining sin. Okay? Sin to sin is not the gaining of pleasure. It's the loss of it. Why? Because real pleasure is found in God. These are just little nuggets we could be teaching our kids. It's, just, it's a mindset change. The devil tries to resurrect what Jesus has already crucified at Calvary. When he comes and whispers and tries to pull on your flesh, you have to remind him that old man was crucified. He no longer lives. Christ lives within me. So I, I, I want to just encourage as a father and as a brother more of tonight. Like more of the running around. More of the joy. More of not caring what people think. More of this, and hopefully it spills out as a lifestyle, right? Where we stop coming to church like we're stopping at the gas pump to fill up. And then we just hold on during the week till we run out of gas and plug back in on Sunday morning. The, the church is not a, a gas pump. Am I preaching good, Reggie? All right. So, Holy Spirit, I just ask that you would help us to think rightly about who we are in you. God, that you would enlighten us concerning the born-again experience. That you would unlock the mysteries 
of the kingdom in our midst. Lord, that you would raise up a joyful, exuberant people who are excited and in love with Jesus. Lord, if, if we've apologized we've denied you like Peter Lord thank you for your grace and your mercy reminding us of the way forward Lord let there be a distinguishing mark upon every believer in every marriage and every family It's like having to be like we it's like we don't do that here we're followers of the way no we don't repay evil for evil we don't operate according to the systems of the world we don't have the culture of the world we have the culture of Christ but again, we just live in this world that just tries to submerge you. It's like you watch television. You need this. You need this. You need this. No godliness with contentment is great gain. But if we don't have the word, if we don't have the spirit of truth operating in us, we're, are, we're just blown. We're, we're confused. We're double-minded. We've lost our way, and again, we come to church, get the funk knocked off of us for a couple of days. By Wednesday and Thursday, we hate life. We can't wait for our kids to go to bed so we can scroll on Facebook, and then we'll just pray for the next service. That is not what Jesus died for. That is not what he rose again for. Hallelujah. Jesus, we love you tonight. Lord, I pray that you would release holy fascination. Lord, that you would release an oil of love sickness in this house. Lord, that you would woo us back tonight. We just sense the wooing of the Holy Spirit, the tenderness of God, massaging hearts tonight, lovers of His presence. Lord, we set our gaze upon You. I just feel like I need to say that one more time. To sin is not the gaining of pleasure, it's the loss of it. So again, put this in your chamber. Jesus was without sin. He enjoyed continual, overflowing pleasure from God the Father consistently at all times and at all places. And contentment in God keeps you from sin. A right understanding. Oh, you're, you're not missing out at the party, at the bar, at the... It's a waste of time. I mean, I, I believe you can get so locked in to God's pleasure... That it's, it's not, it's just like he creates a hatred in you for what once allured you. you. You literally once could not stop looking at that screen. And now it makes your stomach turn inside out. And not religion, not someone bashed you over the head with a Bible. You just recognize your identity in Christ. The new creation reality became your home.
Hallelujah. I know you guys just told me you just got married right a week ago. And what, what an amazing time right now that you guys have together to say no to the world. What does that mean? The world says children are a burden. God says children are a blessing. I mean, I could give you 10 things that pop in my head of lies that the world is going to tell you as a newly married couple that the kingdom of God would stand radically opposed to. And I just want to bless you. Let's just stretch out our hands. Lord, we just thank you for their union. I just have a heart to bless them tonight, Lord, that you would pour out your spirit upon them, Lord, that you would ignite a fire in them for purity in this generation. I see you guys reaching out to youth. Spirit of confusion has broken in. And I just, I, I see a, an Elijah, spirit and power of Elijah, the prophetic Lord, even tonight, unlock the realm of dreams and visions. I hear the Lord saying there's a holy separation coming. You all to me. Lord, we just bless them tonight. Fill them with the Spirit. I was writing about this online this week and made everybody mad. I'm like, you know these folks, they were on fire for God single. They get married and the fire dies. Right? Because we got married and saluted to the American dream. I'm going to spend the next 10 years trying to put as much money in my bank as I can have kids, buy whatever. And it's like all of that at the expense of God's desire to take fire and fire and double the fire. But you got to fight it. <laughs> Might look a little different. The fire of God in your marriage when you have kids might look like learning how to discipline them. Oh, hallelujah. Might be learning how to do the dishes. Might be learning how to bite your tongue. Lord, send revival. And you're like, you're missing it, brother. He's trying to send revival. It's called radical servanthood. Laying down your life for your wife. You're looking for the prophetic word at the meeting. No, it's literally right in front of you. The trash is full. No, I, I just want to help you. It's, it's way more practical. It's way more doable. But you, you do this every day. This is not like rah, rah, good service, and then you get hyped. And this is literally cultivating the presence and the glory of God is learning how to lay your life down every single day and asking Holy Spirit, remind me and help me how to even become comfortable in who you've called me to be. I hope this is helping someone. Without the presence of God, there's no house of God. All you have is a place. Thank you, Lord. I want to wanna read to you. I know... Some theologians among us are saying, well, brother, the presence of God is everywhere. What are you talking about? We know that there's the omnipresence of God, which means that God is everywhere at all times. The Bible says his glory will cover the earth as the water covers the seas. What I'm getting after tonight is referred to as the manifest presence of God. It's more than just knowing he's here. It's beginning to sense and understand that when he comes into the room, as the song says, everything changes. 
It's more than just an awareness that God is here. There's a right response. As soon as Jacob recognizes, oh man, God has been here and I haven't known it. He immediately goes to making a vow, making an altar to the Lord and says, this requires something of me. You hear this generation like, I was in the glory. You, you, you weren't in the glory. You're, you're still cussing your wife. You, you were having an emotional experience stirred on by the drums and guitar. That's what you had. When you're in the glory of God, it changes you from the inside out. When, when, you, when you sense the presence of God, when you feel His glory, I want to encourage you Rather than looking for gold dust and gems and angels, take a look inside and say, Lord, what in me needs to be transformed from glory to glory? All right, I know we're shutting down the charismatic movement now. No, I'm telling you, God is going to send a glory and a presence to the last day's church, and it's going to look like healthy marriage and family. I just long to be in some kind of church that, that associates revival with that. Not kooky, crazy people. Like you say, the end times. People are just assuming some guy who left his wife to study post-trib, pre-trib, non-trib. It's like, no, no, no. We're, we're talking about God injecting eternity into marriages and families. Helping them to learn how to love one another well prior to the return of Christ. So how many of you are familiar with the Azusa Street Revival? The early 1900s, very famous. I wanted to read you some information or some eyewitness accounts of what was going on there to help maybe give your mind a frame of reference for when they said, the presence of God is here. It didn't look like 1120, next service. It, it, when, when they said the glory of God is here, it looked like something. And again, I believe God is going to recapture his glory and his presence in this generation through a people who are practical but yet radical. All right, so let me talk to you about the box. Can you say the box? Okay, I hope this makes you laugh. So you have brother William Seymour, who is an African-American man virtually illiterate, blind in one eye. And then you had Charles Parham, who is a white brother, but it's going to uh, refer, they, they refer to Charles Parham, who is the, as the, the father of the Pentecostal movement. This white brother was the one who pursued the baptism and helped spearhead it. But a lot of what happened at Azusa Street came through Brother Seymour. So it says, whenever Brother Seymour came downstairs, and you got to remember this isn't a house, the service was usually already in progress, and he would put a shoe crate, which everyone referred to as the box, over his head. Okay, 
So I just want you to picture for a minute the preacher has a shoe box over his head. I'm just sorry to everybody who thinks the preacher has to look a certain way on Sunday. In this revival, the guy put a shoe box over his head. From a natural standpoint, it looked absolutely ridiculous. But for Seymour, it was an act of humility that was highly critical to the power of God being put on display. Sometimes Seymour would sit like a statue with the box on his head for 10 minutes. Other times he would sit like that for one hour. But invariably, whenever Seymour removed the box from his head, the greatest miracles would take place. In fact, listen to this, the box became so sacred and significant that no one dared touch it even when Seymour was not in the room. Brother Signs noticed a glow around the box when it was on Seymour's head. He asked Seymour once what was going on inside the box when it was on his head. He said he was meditating and waiting on God. He also said whenever he spoke to God inside the box, it was a whisper in tongues. And though he could hear himself speaking in tongues, he could understand every word he was saying. Sister Carney said of the miracles, excuse me, Sister Carney said the miracles stopped when Brother Seymour stopped putting his box in the head, excuse me, stopped putting his head in the box. When he quit coming down and putting the box on his head, the revival started dying. Another fascinating, is this okay? I just want to, again, just give you, we talk, oh, revival, move of God, the presence of God, glory of God. What does that even mean? Another fascinating feature of the Azusa Street Revival was the constant abiding, invisible presence of God, which many said was like breathing pure oxygen. One observer said that when Seymour came down from the room and the heavenly choir started singing, the Shekinah glory would rise and fill the whole room And you could breathe so much better as if the room was filled with pure oxygen. Now, because I fly on planes all the time, you ever get on those little puddle jumpers that are disconnected from the the air? And that little sucker's hot, and you're like, dear God, I need the AC. And then when it, some of you don't fly, sorry. But when you push back from the gate, they can turn. You're like, oh, thank. And it just, you feel that cool air. Imagine God's here. And it's just like, now we can breathe. Lord, send the lost. And they walk into our churches and think it's the club. Do you realize this? The goal of the American church is to mimic the environment out in the world, believing that if we can get people comfortable in the world, we can get them saved. The goal of the church has never been to be a subculture of the world. Prove it. Are you ready? Here's God's idea of church growth, Pentecost. At 9 o'clock in the morning, he gets his disciples drunk in the Holy Ghost, and instead of being effective communicators, holding everyone in their seats, they're speaking in languages no one understands. No, this is not the ark model. This is not, this is the God model. 
get people drunk at nine in the morning, talking in languages no one understands. It needs an explanation. So Peter stands up, and rather than apologizing and saying, I'm sorry for the Holy Spirit doing his thing, he says, repent, you crucify Jesus. No, I don't think we get it. I'm just going to say it one more time in love. The mission and the vision of the church was never to water things down to make sinners feel comfortable in their sin. The church in the book of Acts was not a safe place for compromise. I'm, I'm telling you, it just makes me want to cry. If we would do it his way, we would get his results. Because again, some of us are thinking, brother, that would never work. How many souls did it bring in? 3,000. 3,000 souls came in one day from holy drunkenness, tongues that no one understands, and in your face, you crucified him, repent. I, I really, I long, like many of you, to see him come. But unless we're willing to reject the world's methods, their thinking. This is not corporate America. This is not some CEO. This is God's ways, paving the way for God's people to host his glory in the last days. I'm just excited. I'm, I'm just, I'm looking forward to like looking people in the eyes in our next season here at the Altar Global, just encouraging them in righteousness. <laughs> like, not, not feeling like I have to make a guy in adultery feel good about his sin. Like I, I just, I, I look forward to having youth, helping them to realize an addiction to video games is going to make you a poor husband and father one day. I'm just excited about this. But again, some people aren't excited about that because they've got one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom. You, all church has to be an hour or people lose their attention span. I'm not buying it. Because you're playing video games and watching movies for hours and you won't even get up to use the restroom. Oh, just we just gotta call it's idolatry. You don't like we we I feel like we try to and again I, I preached at a church one time, ten thousand people go to the pastor's office. He says to me, please do not say sin, please do not say repent. Please do not mention the word revival. Can you call sin a hang up? But again, in that, go, go back. What's the thing? We've got to get as many butts in seats. We've got to run as many services as possible. We've got to have as many campuses to make ourselves look good versus, uh, I'm not interested in any of that. And again, I'm not preaching against growth and multiplication. I'm just telling you, if we do it his way, we'll grow more. We'll host his glory. I, I really believe that. You know, if, if you're like, brother, you're going too negative. Let me talk a little bit more positive. So I, I tell like Sean Smith, I admire you, man. Or Mario Murillo. He just tells, he throws daggers and makes you laugh. He, throws you under the bus and you don't really even know he did it because you're just laughing. I don't really have that gift. 
It's kind of like black and white. So sometimes if I offend you, talk to my wife and she'll say what I said in a different way and you'll feel better about it, I promise. We've been married so long now, she just kind of cuts me off. It's like, what he really meant was, I'm like, yeah, good, honey, good. Come on, pray with me. We need her to preach at the Ark Fellowship. We've got to have some, yeah, we've got to have some balance here. I just, I, 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 feel, I feel a father's heart. I don't know if you're 16 years old. I don't know if you're 57. I pray that God would free you tonight from apologizing about how you're choosing to raise your kids, how you're choosing to walk with Christ. If you're not married yet, please just go for God. Don't, don't worry about what they're going to think. You run after God as hard as you can. And look to the left and to the right. Not always, but it's okay to look. But if you've got somebody that's running at your pace and they've got the same goals and the same... Don't, don't pull back. Don't missionary date. Don't, don't try to convince yourself that you can save someone who literally has a whole set of values and standards that are contrary to the word of God. You're going to become compromised in that pursuit. All right, I think a few people woke up. Hallelujah. Where were we? Yeah, the box. Did I lose you or are we doing good? All right, we'll be out by midnight. I'm just kidding. Okay, so the pure oxygen. Others said it was like heaven coming down. Sometimes, the, listen, this, the visible mist was only a foot high in the room and people would lie down in it just so they could breathe in God's glory. Imagine how freaky it would be if a foot-high mist covered the room. And again, now we'd be looking for the fog machine. No, in revival, you don't need a fog machine. It's called the glory of God. What do you want to say, Holy Spirit? I feel like the Lord is saying because when there's not a real move, you have to manufacture the move. 